All right, Ray Binkowski, smallbusinesstogrow.com. We have Joe Walsh Jr., not to be confused with his son, Joe Walsh the third, who also works in his business. And his business is Walsh and Associates, and they are a nationwide independent financial planning and wealth management company. Did I get that right, Joe? That's absolutely right. That's what I'm doing now. Perfect. Uh, I got to tell you, though, Ray, I, uh, I started out in the restaurant business. And when, uh, when I talk to people about uh, uh, small business or the restaurant business, I always uh, I like to tell the story about uh, kind of the mistakes I made, but or kind of the mistakes I made or what I learned along the way. And uh, basically, I graduated college with a business degree. And um, at the same time, I was a manager of a restaurant, local restaurant. And um, I told the boss that I'm going to quit because I've got my degree and I want to open a restaurant where closer to my parents in Maryland. So uh, when I told him I was going to quit, he says, well, why don't you buy this place? And I said, because I didn't know it was for sale. So what I did was uh, we made an agreement. And uh, shortly after I graduated from college, I bought this restaurant. And I'm, I'm a 21-year-old recent graduate from uh, Northern Illinois University, thinking that I've, I know the restaurant business. I've been running it for this gentleman for years. And uh, I'm now out to prove myself in the restaurant business. Um, what I didn't realize, and kind of this is what I would want to tell other people about, is um, I didn't know enough about the restaurant business to really know about the restaurant business. So I was relatively successful in those first couple of years. And um, one of the uh, ex-employees of mine, uh, he, had, uh, was, he was an excellent employee, but he had moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and he was a racehorse trainer. And uh, he kept telling me, Joe, if you want to make some money, buy a racehorse. And I said, I don't know anything about racehorses. No. And then he, but he kept harassing me. So finally, after I was probably about 23 years old, and he called me up and he says, Joe, we, I got the best opportunity for you. There's a race coming up there. Every horse gets sold for, is eligible to be bought for $10,000. Well, there's a 25 thousand dollar horse running in this race and i could if i wanted to buy this ten thousand uh, dollar horse anybody could buy him all you have to do is put up the 10 grand before the before the gate opens and they run once the gate opens and they run you own the horse if he breaks his leg you own the horse you still got to pay the 10 grand so that's how i got into the racehorse business and i was in the racehorse business for probably about four or five months and I had four or five months of bills from the racehorse business. He did, he did come in second a couple of times. He came in third a couple of times. And I did make some money on him. But my costs, I was spending $1,000 a month to uh, feed him and train him. But I was also spending money because he has to go to the tooth doctor or the foot doctor or whatever. So after about three or four months, I told the trainer, um, and the, the last race that I had with him owning him, he came in dead last. And so far, I was down at the, um, the uh, finish line, and I'm watching the horses go by really fast. And then it's like, I never saw my horse. And then I look back, and he's, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. he's coming up dead <laughs> last. So I told the trainer, I said, just sell him. I said, I don't know anything. All I know is I paid ten grand, and I'm losing $1,000 a month. So um, this is what I call the Jesterson Jr. story, because that was the name of the horse. So basically, I told the guy to sell the horse, and he says, it's going to take some time to sell him. And I said, sell him cheap. And he goes, it's still going to take some time to sell him. I said, sell him real cheap. And he says, well, how cheap? And I said, well, how much will Alpo give you for him? And he says, Joe, you cannot possibly sell this horse for Alpo, because this is a $10,000 horse. And you know, I said, just give me the number so I know what the bottom line is. I know I'm going to get at least this. He says, $2,000. So I said, okay, sell them for $2,000. And he says, you can get more than that for him. I said, I don't want more than that for him. I just want to get rid of them. 
So he says, and if you think, then I said to the trainer, if you think it's too cheap, I'll sell it to you. And he says, I don't have any money. And he said, that's okay, you can owe me. So that's how I got into the racehorse business. And that's how I got out of the racehorse business. And I was, I, in the, in the mean, and he never paid me too. I never got paid. He owed me, but he's a good guy. And he, and if I ever write a book on finance, it's going to be, he got me to know how to do finance. And it was a tuition payment, but basically uh, uh, I lost the $14,000. He never paid me the 2000. I'd probably pay him 2000 for the, uh, ex for the experience. But what I decided or what I learned from that is I don't know anything about racehorses. I don't know the costs. I don't know the expenses. I didn't know anything about racehorses. And then I'm thinking, what do I know about the restaurant business? I think I know that I can order the food and I can be nice to the customers and stuff like this. But uh, uh, what do I know about the restaurant business? So what I decided was is, this was an opening, a eye-opening moment for me that said, uh, learn more about the business. So don't be just in the restaurant business blindly saying, I buy food, I sell it for more than I paid for it, and I make money. So and I, I, think, I think that that's a common, I made that mistake. Uh, I bought a brick and mortar health club and had had sales experience, had had sales management experience, had had executive level experience working for somebody else and it owned my own business, two businesses already. And I knew nothing about a health club, but figured why well, I already have done these things. So I'll buy this. How hard could it be? So, and, and you probably, I'll let you go back to the restaurant yeah. thing. So talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So what I decided was, is maybe I should spend my time learning more about business and small business. So what I did is I said, uh, I could be looking at a disaster and not see it. Or alternatively, I could be looking at an opportunity of a lifetime and not see it. So what I decided to do, we we're in a college town and I decided to go back and get my MBA in finance. So I was running the restaurant business, which is a full-time job. And I had four babies uh, uh, under my belt already. So I had children to feed. But what I did is I went and took it, uh, one or two classes at the most at a time. It took me six years to get my MBA. And during those six years, I learned about accounting. I learned about marketing. I learned about uh, business, finance, and things like that. And I it really made my eye opening. I'd take a class in cost accounting, then I would apply cost accounting to my restaurant. I would take a class in marketing and I would apply the marketing uh, piece to my restaurant. And because I had a small business while I was getting the MBA and I could apply real life situations, it was really, really valuable to me. Um, um, the eye-opening experience or the thing that I would say I learned and this racehorse, I haven't talked to the trainer since we sold him. He's a really nice guy, but he lives in Louisville, Kentucky. If I saw him, I'd thank him for the, it was the best tuition I've ever spent because what it taught me was learn more about marketing, learn more about finance, learn more about uh, uh, cost accounting and things like that. And those, those mistakes oftentimes, and I found this and I've talked to other business owners, I've got a, a local business owner here. He's described it the same way as the mistakes are really the tuition. Like you already had a four-year bachelor's level education and a business degree. Mm -hmm. And here you are coming up short, not knowing what you don't know in the restaurant business and then making it worse, you buy a racehorse. Well, the racehorse was the epiphany. It, it kind of, I thought I knew what I was doing in the restaurant business, but once I took a class in some of these things, like I took a class in wage and wage and salary, I learned all about the rules on, on that. And it's like, here, how could I own a business for five years and not know this stuff? Or I took a, a class on uh, uh, pension plans and the pension plans were, I could have been opening my own pension plan for all these years. And since I had all college kids that weren't, didn't stay there for more than a year, I couldn't hire them until they were 21 because we had liquor. So, but then they graduate. So I could have had 
a pension plan and not have to contribute to any of the employees. But, you know, the only full-time employee was me. So it's like, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, so what, what I learned from the, this is to get more, more experience um, uh, or get, get every event. So um, I was very successful in the restaurant business, but I think it was, it was because, I mean, I knew the cost of everything. This is in the days of the Apple II computer. Remember Apple IIe or whatever it was? Uh, I had uh, what is now Excel. Back then, I think it was called BusyCalc. But I had my entire menu. If the price of, uh, of hamburger meat changed, I can change the price on my spreadsheet. and It'll change my food cost on my food cost sheet. And I, so I knew the cost, the immediate cost of every item on my menu. So, so in, for people, and I want to interrupt you there for a second, Joe, for people watching this, if you are new to business ownership, or you think you want to be an entrepreneur, or you've been in business and in, in practice for real for years, if you don't understand the numbers that drive your business, and I'm big on spreadsheets too, Joe. I, I've got an Excel spreadsheet open for our meeting today. And with my brick and mortar business, that was my rule and guide for everything. But a lot of the business owners I talk to, they don't have that. So your hamburger cost goes up. You know what your percent margin is on, on, the, on the sales side. Well, if that food cost goes up here, the menu should go up accordingly or your margins eroding. Yeah. Now, I'll give you an example. When I was in the restaurant business, once I got my MBA and I understood the business, I was running it by the numbers. I wanted food costs to be 35%. I want labor to be 25%. Those are my two biggest things. That 60% of every dollar coming in is going to go to just those two things, labor and food costs. All the other things, the fixed costs, uh, represented about another, um, let's see, that's 60, it was 90%, so it was another um, 30%. So I knew the cost of my rent, my utilities, my garbage pickup, my pest control, all the other fixed costs. And I knew that if, I, if my sales kept going up, I would make the, follow, the, the resulting 10%. So on every item that I had on the menu, I could say, I got to price it so that I can make 10%. Occasionally, some of the food wholesalers would come out with, uh, let's say, pre-made desserts. And they'd say, uh, Joe, we have this, um, some apple pie or something, and it costs you so much a, a slice, and you could sell it for so much a slice. I remember there was... Um, you probably remember uh, fried mushrooms, fried zucchini, fried cauliflower, that kind of stuff. That was how long ago it was. But um, they had these little cheese balls. And uh, when I priced it, it's like, my th now this is a long time ago. So these appetizers were costing like $4.99. You know, today they'd probably cost seven bucks or eight bucks. But they were $4.99, but I knew my food costs. And they came up with the little cheese balls that you could sell. But the food costs on those, I'd have to charge like, you know, seven dollars or something when you can get about a whole basket of onion rings for for four dollars or something. And I decided uh, I they might sell, but I'm not going to sell. I won't be able to sell them for seven dollars. And my margins are better on the other things. So I'm just not going to have an item that I can't make the money. But, the, but getting back to my formula, I made 10%. So Ray, if you worked for me at that time, and let's say you were making $10 an hour and you said, Joe, I want to raise. So I have to decide if I move you from $10 to $12 an hour, I have to make that part of my food cost or my overall costs. So um, there was a guy that was a fairly good cook and I never played preference with anybody. If, the, if a good cook was making 10 bucks an hour, all the good cooks were making 10 bucks an hour. There was no, you make 10, he makes nine, but don't tell him that he's only making nine. 
everybody made all the good cooks or the good waitresses or the bartenders made the, roughly the same amount of money. But um, he came to me and said something like he wants more money because of this, 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 and this. And I said, my, my, my payroll cost is a fixed number. I said, uh, you either have to be able to cook better than somebody else. We rely on you better than else. Maybe you can do, you can do, do the kitchen during the day when you're the only cook where somebody else can't, but there has to be a compelling reason. But here's the reason for me. If I raise you up from $10 to $12, that increases my food cost by 20, my payroll cost by 20%. Now, if, if, if my food cost is already at 25% of labor, that means it's going up to 27.5% of labor if it's just 10%. So either I got to raise everybody or not. But then guess what? If, I, if my labor costs go from 25% to 27.5%, I get the residual. So my, pay, my income goes from 10% down to 7.5%. So giving you a, a, a raise lowers my pay by 25%. It's like, I want to be fair with everybody, but I got to be fair with myself. So it's, it's not like I'm, I'm giving you X amount of dollars because you're worth X amount of dollars. If, if I could give you more, or if I should give you more, but I should give every cook more and every waiter or, or every bartender more, then I should raise my prices. So I have to run, do this um, valuation is I want to pay people fairly, I want to give the client or the customer a good value, but I don't want to just raise my, my costs and just the result is I make less money. So I could be it, the nicest guy in the world, but if I don't make money, I'm not in business. And I, and I think that that's, there, there's a lot of value in everything you just said. It, it really drives home why it is so important to understand the numbers that run your business and in many industries, there are some standards, like if you have a restaurant, a bar and restaurant, you, your fixed cost should be this percent, your labor should be this percent. And if you go over that, you may have a problem, there's a tipping point. But the, the other thing is, and, and I found this out, it's easy to want to be good to everybody. But in, in at the end of the day, it's not that you have to be greedy, but at the end of the day, the, there needs to be enough re revenue for the business to breathe because that's the oxygen. And you better make sure that you're also able to pay yourself something. Well, if you don't pay yourself something, you're just spinning <clears throat> your wheels. And, right. I mean, it's a hobby. Yeah, it's a hobby, really. So what I, what I learned there is it's a formula. Uh, but just know the formula. I didn't know when I before I started that my food costs were going to be 35% and my labor cost was going to be 25%. But once I realized that everything runs by the numbers, uh, the, the, uh, the, what I was, what a famous Joe Walsh saying at the time was labor cost is 25%, food cost is 35%. I have a set amount of fixed, fixed expenses. And if I can take care of labor and I can take care of food costs and my sales go up, Joe Walsh will be taken care of. I'll make my 10%. But if all of a sudden I'm looking at my, my let's say during the summer when things were slow, um, let's say I'm looking at my food costs are still 35%, but my labor cost is 30%. Well, that means during this, those, those months or it's like that, I only make 5%. So since you don't get your results, at the same, you know, the same day that you, you know, if, if everybody got paid, if every small business guy got paid at the end of the day, they would make a whole lot better decisions. They would say, I'm not doing that again, or that was pretty good. I'm going to, I'm going to run that or do that. And I think too, that like, you know, that uh, many businesses have seasonality almost regardless of what industry, I mean, you can cherry pick, but there's busy, even for Amazon, there's, days of the year where Amazon sales are greater than the average day the rest of the calendar year. And that too is something that that business owner needs to be aware of, which is what you said, hey, in the summertime, sales go down. And if I don't manage these numbers or if these go up, it's coming right out of my pocket. Yeah. Now I had a cook, this is kind of a famous Joe Wall story, but uh, 
I had a cook. We had a, you know, you'd get your sandwich and you get your fries or onion rings, whatever it is. But uh, he would take a slice of uh, cantaloupe and a piece of lettuce and or maybe a couple grapes. So his garnish was he added cantaloupe and he added this couple grapes and we catered. So we had cantaloupe and grapes and stuff on hand. So I saw one of the dishes, one of the sandwiches going out. And I said to Keith, I said, what's this? He goes, it makes it look better. I said, yeah, but that's not part of my food costs. He goes, Joe, it's a nickel. How much could a slice, a tiny slice of cantaloupe cost? I go, I don't know if it costs a nickel or a dime or a penny. All I know is it wasn't accounted for. So it's, and, and if it should be that way, like if the clients wanted a slice of cantaloupe as a garnish with their sandwich, then maybe we should put it on. But I don't want to put it on without knowing the cost of that. It's not so, in the spreadsheet. Yeah, it's not on my spreadsheet. <laughs> That's huge. So, and, but it, he looked at me like I was nuts. He goes, Joe, it's a nickel. It's a nickel. I said, it's a nickel times every single sandwich I sell. 20 it, nickels is a dollar. I, yeah, <laughs> good. I should have said that. And it I gets out of hand said, real quick. 20 nickels is a dollar. Now, this is back when, you know, a, a, you know, a half pound burger was, you know, four bucks, three ninety nine. So, I mean, a nickel was a lot on three ninety nine. And you probably had in, in this, too, there's probably a point elasticity or plasticity, whatever we maybe uh, want to apply. But if you go from three ninety nine to four forty nine, you may not be selling burgers in your market at that time. Mm -hmm. So exactly. you can't just go and arbitrarily throw a nickel on because you might price yourself out of the market. Yeah. And people look at you like, Joe, it's a nickel. It's like, but we're selling hundreds of nickels a day. Right. It's not a nickel. Yeah. And then there's how many days in a month, you know, and how many months in a year. So it's, it's, that's an expensive garnish. Now, if I could add, and remember my food cost was 35%. So if it cost me a nickel, I'd have to add 15 cents to keep my margins the same way. But he looked at me like I was the cheapest guy in the planet. And, and, and there just, again, I, I think that's, that's where, imagine that guy kind of being like you, I'm going to go open my own restaurant and not recognizing the impact of adding a nickel in cost yep. to every sandwich that goes out of the kitchen. That's significant. Well, I don't want to hope he doesn't see this, but he did open a restaurant and he did open it and it closed within a couple of years. So, um, and, and I, I, I just learned, you know, that Justice and Junior Horse was the one that told me to learn more about it. There's a second part to the Justice and Junior story too. The first part is I bought a horse and it taught me how to know my costs. Uh, but the second part of the Justice and Junior story, which is really, really important, is I sold the horse or the, the whole Justice and Junior was before I went into graduate school. As part of graduate school to get an MBA, I needed to take a statistics class. And as a graduate level class, I had to do a project in statistics. So I had to do a statistical analysis of something and report it to the professor. So what I did was I said, I'm going to see how many $10,000 claiming horses actually make money. So what I did is I knew the cost because I had them. You know, I had <laughs> a trainer a thousand bucks. I had the tooth doctor, the hoof doctor, the transporting in between the different racetracks and everything. And I, and I knew that, so I knew the cost. I just didn't know the odds of making money. So as my statistical project, now this is probably five years after I had sold the horse, but five years after I went and did, there's a uh, racing library that takes all horses and they tell you when they started racing their winnings per year, et cetera, et cetera. And you can find out the statistics on any race horse that's ever existed. So what I did is I went to this racing library and I followed the rate. I followed 350 
$10,000 claiming horses. And I just picked them at random. And I said, what were their winnings for the next five years? Now, horses don't last a long time. So uh, depending on the age of the horse, but they all, they don't, they don't live past 20, you know, or they can't race. But so I did five years after they were claimed and the statistical answer, and I got an A in this class, but the statistical answer is I had about one half of 1% chance of breaking even. Now, the moral of the story is I could have done that research had I known before I bought the damn horse. Can you say damn? Yeah. Can, okay. You can say whatever you want. Okay. Well, I could have bought, I could have, when the guy told me, let's buy a $10,000 claiming rate horse, I can, could have gone to the racing library and done the research then and would have saved a whole lot of money, but I didn't. And actually that, that is a story I use in my finance discussions uh, of, of running Walsh and Associates now is it's what is the probability of you making money with this thing? If I had done that same research, just can a $10,000 claiming horse make money with my costs, the answer would be no. And I wouldn't have done the investment. Um, so part B to the Justice and Junior story is do the research. If you can say uh, in my classes, sometimes I, I'll do classes on starting small businesses and um, I'll say, know the market. And you go, what do you mean know the market? And I say, how many people go to these restaurants? Like if you wanna open a restaurant, uh, let's say it's um, like TGI Fridays, a good example for a restaurant. Uh, you can say how many people go to TGI Fridays? You know, and if you go into the restaurant TGI Fridays and say, you know, how many, how many uh, people do you serve a day? They're not going to answer you. That's none of your business. But you can sit outside with a clicker and click every time somebody walks in. And, if, and you can do that for a week. And if you don't want to do it for a week, somebody at minimum wage will do it for a week. But you can know how many people walk into that restaurant say, as clients. And it's not illegal. So you know, do your research, it, find out. So I have, I have a it, kind of a parallel story to that. I have a industry consultant friend of mine. Uh, he's been in the fitness industry as a consultant for over four decades. And decades back, he realized he's selling himself to businesses. He needed to know about market research for real estate, selecting locations, renting, buying, whatever. And even though he wasn't a college kid, he was a young adult, went and volunteered with a real estate group and an architecture group. As he said, I want to be an intern. I just want to learn. And one of the groups gave him the job. They said, hey, look, we have Wendy's as a client and they're looking for locations in these markets. And we need to provide them with the guidance to pick the spot. And he said, all right, cool. He said, he said I, this will give me a great chance to learn. And they said, great. So here's a list of the McDonald's in the, in the markets. And we need you to dumpster dive and pull the receipts. Because we're actually, if McDonald's is making money, we know Wendy's can go on that block across the street, kitty corner, whatever. And they're going to make money. But yeah. you you may not want to dumpster dive, but I think, again, you, you bring up a great point is you, you need to understand what research you should be doing. You, you need to do the research and you need to be able to read the results of the research. Absolutely. There's, I have a very good friend that started a company similar to your story, but he does it for fast food restaurants. And what he would do is he would he would do an analysis of a company like Wendy's or McDonald's or Burger King or something like this, but he will get information so down to the nitty gritty. He'll know that people don't want to take left-hand turns across traffic to get into a McDonald's. They will take a right-hand turn, but not a left-hand turn, or they'll, they'll know if the traffic on some road is so many thousand cars per year, per day, or whatever it is, you need a certain amount of cars to go by and they will price the real estate. This corner is good and it's worth X amount of dollars, but this corner just 
three lots over, just so you don't take right-hand turns, you take left-hand turns or vice versa, is worth double than that one. And his whole business was, a, it's a statistical company for, for locations of restaurants and fast food restaurants in particular. But it's, it's, it's phenomenal, the research that they have. And my thinking is just know what you can do. And as a small business person, it's, you know, you can't go hire some big, you know, uh, New York firm to do the, where you should put your hot dog stand, but the big hot dog stands do, and they know, and they know they're worth it, but you're, you're absolutely right. Do the research. And I'd much rather have you spin your wheels for, I mean, you know, do the research for six months before you commit. Then it's a to, lot less expensive. Oh yes, absolutely. And, but I think you have to be in small business to know how much those things actually work. Because you could, you know, in the restaurant business, we used to go on a, on a tour. We'd take the manager of the restaurant and some of the higher ups in the, in, the, in the chain of my employees. But we would go into the city and we would see what does Applebee's have as their new appetizers? What does TGI Fridays have with their new appetizers? And I'm probably dating myself by saying these restaurants, but you know what, uh, what do these restaurants have that's new? And so we'd go there and how much are they pricing it for? And uh, so we'll look at new, new dinner or new dishes or new uh, appetizers or, or maybe new drinks or new examples. And they, but we would go, it was kind of like an eat-a-thon because we'd go restaurant to restaurant to restaurant. <laughs> and when we get there, we'd say, we're going to order one of these and one of these, but we might have six people, but ordering just two meals and three appetizers. So, uh, but then we go to another restaurant. By the time we're on our way home, we're stuffed, but we have a lot of research done. And that's, and I think that's something a lot of people get into business or they think they want to be an entrepreneur. They think they want to own their own business. And to hear your story, like you were the owner and you were the one leading the group out there going restaurant to restaurant with the other people. And I think, and in my experience in talking to new business owners, there's this assumption that, well, there's somebody that I just pay and they go do that. Well, first of all, you won't have the capital to just pay somebody to do that. Second of all, you better have a thorough understanding yourself or you're not going to, they come back with the data. You're not going to understand how to read the data. Exactly. And um, it could be that um, like we would always quiz the waiter or the waitress and say, what's your best selling appetizer? You know, and they would say it what it is, and then maybe we would order that one. But if it's, uh, but a good example is onion rings. You can buy onion rings, pre-made, pre-battered. All you do is they're frozen. You just take them out, put them in the fryer. But an onion is dirt cheap. You can batter your own onions for almost nothing. Zero. I mean, the cost is almost zero. And what we used to do is we'd take the onions. And we'd just do the big rings and would make them into the onion rings. And all the little tiny ones would just chop up and put them on the pizzas, you know, or put them on the sandwiches or something. You know, nobody, when you're looking at your sandwich, you don't know if that came from an onion this big or an onion this big. All you know right. was a ring. So we would take the big rings and, and make it for it. So, and, uh, but, uh, and everything was pre-portioned. So we didn't, if, if it was an eight ounce burger, we didn't buy eight ounce burgers because you had to pay a premium for an eight ounce burger. Uh, so what we did is we'd buy a bag of beef and we'd, we'd weigh it. And then we'd, uh, we'd pre, pre-portion everything. So if somebody ordered a board burger, this isn't somebody saying, I'll make the burger now. Uh, it's a pre-portioned burger and I know it's exactly eight ounces. And it's not, not, not seven and it's not nine. And that goes back again to kind of your initial points is you you knew eventually you paid the tuition realized i got to get better at understanding what numbers are driving my business exactly. and you knew what percent of your your cost had to go to food and if every burger is going out of the kitchen a different size you're not controlling your costs no nope. you're you're making more margins going up on some burgers 
and it's going way down on the other ones. So there again, you, you have to understand the numbers. And the other part of that is I talked to another uh, re- restaurant tour. This was years ago. This was, I-, I can tell you when it was, this would have been Good Friday 2000, Good Friday 2000. I talked to a business owner and I was asking him questions and he ended up inviting me into the kitchen. So I spent like two hours with this guy and he was making soup that they sold in the restaurant himself. So here's the guy that owns the place. You, you know, my impression was the owner is just counting, stacking hundred dollar bills up, 10 in a pile saying thousand, thousand, thousand. No, he was in the kitchen making soup. And he told me, he goes, this is one of my highest margin products if we make it in-house and I can go buy soup and serve it. It won't taste as good, but it costs so much more. And I don't remember what the numbers were, but it was like a a 10 X increase in profitability on a bowl of soup. If he made it himself. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And then you just got to see how many bowls of soup, you know, if your costs are double by buying it pre-made, you can make, you can save that food cost. That food cost goes right to the, in your pocket. It goes right to the bottom line. Yeah. So if you can do it, but that's, there'd be items that we couldn't sell for what I'd have for the margins that I'd have to get. So it could be uh, some dessert, let's say that looks beautiful, but I can't get the margins that I can get by making my own apple crisp and put it over ice cream. You know, I can make my own apple crisp, you know, so it's like I can sell this for whatever it was, but I make a whole lot more by doing it myself. And in, in, in there again, you, you have to be willing to make the decision. And sometimes I, I'm hearing there were probably some items not on the menu because mm-hmm. if you put it on the menu, the margin wasn't there. So exactly. you, de- you decided it would be great. This might be popular at other places, but we just can't do it. And you, and you were disciplined enough to not do it. Well, the other thing, though, is if they order this appetizer that costs a lot, that means they're not buying this one that I can make more money. So it's like I'm not just making less. I had every opportunity to make more. I just didn't do it, you know, because I offered that one that didn't have the, that didn't have the, um, the margins in there for me. And uh, I just didn't want to work that hard and not make the money. So there's things that just we just didn't have on the menu. Or another good example is uh, I would go to another restaurant, like not necessarily even in my town, but, you know, 20 miles away or 30 miles away, just because I went there to eat. And I'll see their uh, sandwich. Let's say it's a uh, corn, uh, what do you call it? A Reuben sandwich. I look at their Reuben sandwich. Mine was, let's say, four ninety nine, and theirs was two ninety nine. So all I can think of is, well, that's not going to be the same Reuben sandwich that we sell. Then I'll order it, and it is. So then I'm thinking, this guy's food cost is double what it should be, because he just he wanted to get a good Reuben sandwich, but he had no idea of the cost of that Reuben sandwich. And so, that's. That's another lesson that I, I think business owners a, have, to, have to learn, and that starts with those numbers. Like I, I had an employee leave, and he was going to get like a $7 an hour raise, so 7 bucks. And you know where my old business was, and you, you know like we weren't – household income wasn't going up that much where we were. I, I didn't have it to give him, and I, to, I told him like, hey, that's great. I, I – I will never probably be able to give you that amount of raise. You have to go. Don't feel bad. Thank you for your time here. Good luck. Mm -hmm. And then for a few days, I was really bummed. I was like, man, how, how can they afford to hire him pay $7 an hour more? They're in a similar market. Am I terrible at business? And the answer was, no, they didn't understand their business. They Oh, and they also, they weren't paying rent. They were behind on rent. They were behind on some vehicles they leased in the business name. They were doing payroll by hand. And instead of sending the withholdings where it was supposed to go to the government, they were keeping that. And I think in part it was they were just terribly ignorant 
about what it meant to own and operate and run a business. And they quickly got in way over their head. And I was doing things right. And lo and behold, you really can't pay somebody $7 an hour more. Nope. I have a similar experience that a new, we used to, our big thing was pan pizza. And with pan pizza, I was really, um, we, we were kicking butt with pan pizza. We were at, it, we, that was our claim to fame and we were voted best pizza in town and the whole bit. And, and maybe um, five years, seven years into it, um, another place came in and did pan pizza. And they said, uh, uh, I'm just going to call it pizza XXX. But Joe, pizza XXX is half your price and just as good. And I said, well, they cannot possibly be half the price and be just as good because I know what it costs, you know. So uh, I went down there and uh, I tried it. And I can honestly say it was a good pizza. It was definitely half the price. And it was getting comparable to mine. But I, all I could think of was, how do I compete with this? It's a good pizza, but it's literally half price. And all I thought was I could lower my prices and we can both not make any money or every, I knew his food costs. I knew his rent costs. I knew his electric costs. I know his labor costs because they were the same as mine. Basically what I did is I kind of wished him well and said, I hope a lot of people go there because for it, the more people go there, the more he loses and the faster he loses it. So if I could say, I'm going to close up for six months while you go out of business. But basically, I just didn't compete with him at all. He did have a, a very good business, but he was out of business in six months. And, I, and I'm thinking, I can't do anything about that, but I'm not going to go out of business with him. Yeah, you knew your numbers and you were disciplined enough. To go, tr first of all, to be the one to go try the pizza. And again, if you're a business owner, it's your job. You know, you're steering the ship and you need to have that market intelligence yourself. Just like Joe, you need to be the one that goes and tries the pizza and says, hey, you know what? It's, it's not bad, but I'm disciplined enough to know his costs are the same as mine. And if I price mine at his, I'm going to lose. And we're both going to go out. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And there's certain things. Um, you just can't do. I mean, uh, like cut my price. I didn't make 50% profit. I made 10% profit, literally. So of every dollar that came in, I made roughly 10%. And, uh, but it was never 30%. Uh, you know, it just doesn't work that way. So if you know the numbers, you know your costs, you know your expenses, you know, and you keep track of them because they change, um, then you're fair to the customer, you're fair to yourself, and you can say, you know, I had a good career in the restaurant business. And, and you have to be willing, because like you mentioned something there with the cost changing. You have to allow time to work on your business. I, I see a lot of clients I talk to, they're, um, especially if they're getting started. And then even some more tenured owners, their business success is in large part because they're constantly working in the business and you have to work on the business. So when those raw material costs change, labor costs change, that spreadsheet needs to get opened up on the computer and you need to adjust those numbers. And then you need to look at the bottom line and say, okay, what's the impact and where do I need to adjust so that I keep my 10% margin for me at the end of the year? Yeah. Well, I always believe in key metrics. There are certain things that you as a business owner has to monitor, you know, uh, uh, and it's not just is a restaurant clean are the people friendly, but you got to like food costs are easy to go out of whack, you know, especially with this pandemic going on. And let's say let's say you were a builder and you were still charging the same for the wood in your house as the before went before wood went up. If you don't have some method to say, what is the price of a two by four? What's the price of a piece of sheet of plywood? And you just keep doing it the same old way. Like I sell this house for $300,000 and I've been doing it. I raise my prices a little bit. Well, if your prices of lumber go up, you better, or labor, you better, that better be reflected 
fast. So in business, you better have some type of metric system that says what your costs are or what your service um, level is. You don't want to cut back if you're in a service business like Walsh and Associates now is we don't want to miss anything with, with a client's financial picture. You know, if somebody loses their job or gets sick or can't work or want, needs to retire earlier, I want to know about it because that just changes the metrics. And we want to be part of, of a client's um, uh, picture. But we, if, if we don't measure it, you know, it, it doesn't, so, it, surprises happen. When you, when you look at the, the key performance indicators, like those key numbers, the key metrics, I, I would imagine key metrics, key performance indicators, interchangeable for numbers you need to watch. Do you think when we look at price, I believe that you should have a plan, not just so the business makes more money, but you should have an escalator that gradually adjusts your price so that if you do get a big price increase, you don't have to constantly pass it in its entirety onto the consumer. And do you, what's your opinion on that? Uh, well, now we charge the same price for everything. It's just a percentage of the assets under management. So that's not the issue. But if um, in, in the restaurant business, uh, what we did is we wanted to keep those percentages, you know, 35% for food costs, 25% for labor, 10% for profit and the other stuff takes care of itself. But uh, since we measured it, we measured it every month. So what we, we would do a rolling, a rolling 12 months. So we'd look at what food have we have bought in the last 12 months. And then we know what we bought in the last month, but we drop off another month. Conveniently, if we're, dro if we're adding April, we're dropping off in April. So, we're, you know, we don't have this uh, fluctuation like summers are busier than fall or fall is busy than summer. So we just look at the year, but we, but every year we drop a month off and add a month. So we knew what our food cost was overall, because, you know, we don't know how much ground beef we have in the, in the cooler versus how much we, if, we, if we need it, but that's how we did it. Same thing with, uh, with labor. And actually what for labor, what I do is I'd take what my payroll was and what my sales were for the same time period. And if we're slower, we should have less labor. And if we're busier, we should have more labor. And it, and it should match in almost yeah. parallel the increase in, in revenue or decrease in revenue. Right. And uh, now we only changed our menu prices probably once a year, but it was changed according to known data. It wasn't, you know, I think we should just charge more. That's like a crazy thing to do. Just say, you know, I was getting ten dollars for this last year. I want to get ten fifty this year. That's a crazy way to do it, because it could be you should have been eleven, and the following year you should be eleven and a quarter. I don't, you know, I'm not so that you, good. You we would do. back it out then. So you, using your numbers, you had thirty five percent. Was hmm. that food or was that labor? That was just food. Thirty five percent food, twenty five percent labor. And then you had about. About 30%, I, I call it the other stuff takes is fixed. So that's garbage pickup. That's uh, rent. rent. That's uh, electricity. That's, uh, you know, repairs, stuff like that. But those are the things I, I can't not fix my dishwasher. You know what I mean? So those are just fixed costs. But whether it's your dishwasher break-in or if it's your refrigerator, you just have repairs. And so, oh. yeah, something's going to need to get fixed. Exactly. So what we did is we just we, we did it on a rolling 12 month basis because it's very convenient because you're dropping off. If you're if you're at it in April, you're dropping off in April. So you, and it you, gives you in, in what I like. We typically do it in three months. We'll mm -hmm. use a three months current calendar year versus prior year. Same period. And I've got a way using a spreadsheet that I'll put the numbers together and it will allow me to forecast what we can expect for next month based off last year, what we're currently doing relative to last year. But what I like about your 12 month is it does, and I believe every industry has some seasonality. It kind of washes that seasonality out. Right. And gives yep. you real numbers to make an educated decision. Well, I was in a college town and a college town, you know, they leave in the summer and they come back in the fall. So, and it's every fall and every summer. So, 
there's uh, and there's football season and non-football season. And then there's the big days like homecoming and parents day that we always know we're going to be busy. And then there's the dog days of summer where nothing's going on and you still got to pay rent. The yeah. dishwasher might still break. You still got to buy food because someone might come in and eat. Yeah. So, uh, but we had it down to numbers and I think the, uh, the racehorse and then the MBA in, in, in finance helped me uh, fine tune the reasons for it. It wasn't like, I can honestly say when I first got into business and the first year my accountant came to me with the, with the uh, profit and loss statement. And my, and my automatic instinct is to go, what did I make? You know, I didn't look at what did I sell, what my food cost was, what my labor cost was, what did I make? And I realized very soon or very fast that the, the financial statement is unbelievably uh, intelligent about telling you your numbers. You know, don't look, and it, it could be you made more money this January than you did last January, but that could be flat luck. I want to know it's my labor was less or I'm being more efficient or I'm, or I'm getting my food costs down or something like this. Uh, but I want to know, I want to run the, run the business by the numbers. You want to be pleasant, of course, and, you know, and congenial and give the client or the customer what they want or they should get, but it's running it by the numbers. If you don't run it by the numbers then the numbers are going to run you, you know, I mean, how, I mean, last year you were a year, a year younger. Do you feel older now? No. Yeah, and yes. Are. Yesterday, yesterday was my birthday. Oh, well, happy birthday. So, I, I'm reminded I'm older, but I, I, it's funny. You mentioned that. I remember I had just bought my brick and mortar and I was a few months deep commercial banker because I had two silent partners, the government who got a piece out of every dollar. And then the bank that got interest off every dollar because I had to pay them my commercial note. And the banker called and, and he wanted financials and he was asking about balance sheets and P&Ls and all this stuff. And finally I said, Dave, listen, right now, here's where I am. I look at my credits and debits on the corporate checking account. The credits must be greater than the debits. Yeah, I was so overwhelmed with all of the little things that I didn't know. Like, oh. where do you buy the toilet paper? Where do you get the soap for the bathrooms? Hey, the toilet's broke in the men's locker room. Someone's got it. Well, what plumber do I call? When can he get? There was no time for these financials. And like a lot of business owners I talked to, I was buried working in the business with no time to pick my head up and say, okay, let me put together some financials and let's see. No, it was the monthly credit card statement. What were the credits? What were the debits? Yeah. subtract them. Was it a positive number or a negative? Well, unfortunately, there's a ton of businesses um, that run by the seat of their pants. Some of them are very successful because they have a big enough margin that they can make mistakes. But every business, every business can be better off if you know the numbers. And it, a lot of times it's, it's little things. Like if I had, if I hadn't known my numbers let's say in my desserts if i didn't if all the desserts were 350 and they're probably that you know it dates me again three dollars and fifty cents for a dessert um uh if they were all that way i wouldn't know which ones i'm making money on and which ones i'm not and which ones i'm selling and which ones i'm not and so it's it's the more data you can get and as to which desserts sell more which, you know, if, if the expensive ones, you know, so well, something costs you $2 and you're selling it for three, that's only a, you know, that's a 66% food cost. That's crazy when I'm trying to keep it at 35%. So it could be, don't sell that, sell something else. If they want dessert, you just keep all the desserts at the margins. And if you want to sell an expensive one that costs you more, price it so that, you make the same amount of money or be disciplined enough to not do it. And I had a, when early in my business career, I started doing business offshore 
And I had a, a business to do that. And one of the individuals that was my mentor, um, long story short, there were three keynote speakers at the MBA school, University of Wisconsin, Madison on doing business in Southeast Asia. I went to the conference within a week, I had lunch with two of the three keynote presenters. And those two became my, like my coaches on how to do business overseas. And I remember watching the one and I'm like, every time this guy does something in business, it works. This is like, this guy is amazing. And I realized he was a good business person legitimately. And he paid his dues. He had an MBA and he'd owned a couple businesses. But at the end of the day, he was willing to say no to bad ideas. Like if it was a bad deal or if it wasn't going to be profitable for and it, this, he was in manufacturing. If he wasn't going to make money doing it, he just said no. Even if he really wanted to, he just, he said he walked away. He was willing to walk away. He's like, no, if, if, if it's not going to work, and I'm sure he probably had some numbers that he wanted, he, he knew if, if it's not going to do this, we can't do it. Yeah, the other it, It's going to take money from over here. Well, it all could, also could take his time. So if he has a choice of two projects, one takes a little time, but makes them, they both make the same amount of money. Do the one that takes you a little time and you can make the same amount of money. Um, it, and I, I think that that too takes time to, to be wise enough to just say no. I'm mm -hmm. sure there were things you really wanted to put on the menu and you, I'm positive you looked at them and said, we can't get, we can't get the cost to 35%. Right. We can't get the margin that we need. And we and, can't do it. And especially in like a dessert or sandwich, if they're going to order this sandwich and it's got 50% food costs, if they didn't order that one, we would have got this one where there's 35% food costs. So don't even have the 50% one. It could be, yes, it tastes better. Yes, it's, you know, or, but for the money that I have to get, I'll never sell it. So I'm not going to sell it cheaper unless you can do more of them. And that right. leads to, and that too, if it's not, if you price it too high, you're not going to sell it. And if you're buying, you're buying perishables. I yeah. mean, even the frozen stuff's got a shelf life. Right. And I've had this conversation with businesses. I'm like, why are you, make sure that if you get into something that involves perishable raw materials, that you're going to sell them before they're expired or you're going to be throwing money out. So not only are you, like in your case, you may not make the margin you need to, but if it's priced too high and you're not selling it, you're also throwing more stuff in the garbage, which further increases your cost. Yeah. And that's all reflected in food costs. We don't, we look at money coming in compared to what we money going out, going out and, you know, food and what we sold it, sold it for. And we knew everything we sold. If we, if some, item is not selling we just take it off the menu or if our margins every item on the menu is worth the spot on the menu so if something we only sell two of them a day and the margins are no better than the other stuff there, that's a slot on the menu that we could eat we could sell more of something and obviously else. only two people bought it so it's not like in big demand and you know? And even I, I had this conversation, boy, probably two or three years ago, a local business had changed their dining room, out, room hours. They have dining room, they have delivery, they have takeout. And I, I talked to the owner. I, I've got a habit. If someone owns a business, I ask them a lot of questions about their business, hoping I can steal some ideas and either use them myself or help someone else use them. I said, why did you, why did you do that? He's like, well, he goes, quite honestly, we looked at our revenue those two hours and we looked at our expenses and we looked at that revenue over the last year and the revenue doesn't exceed the expenses. It makes zero sense financially for us to be open. We still have takeout. We still have delivery. So the people that really wanted our, our food, they could still get it. We just, I can't make the business case to have the dining room open. It makes zero sense. So we closed it. Yeah. But you have to know that. I mean, I, I have seen business owners um, just say, I'm in the restaurant business and I'm going to have food and have it opened and I'll make sure everything's clean. They don't do any of this analysis. They couldn't tell you their food costs 
a percentage or not. And uh, I have a good friend that uh, that has a restaurant. He's never, I don't know if he's finished high school. He's um, not an American citizen, but he knows his numbers. Is that he, know, he knows the dollars coming in, the dollars going out. He knows, he holds up a sugar packet and say, this sugar packet is mine. You know, I want, I would prefer that they only use one sugar packet for their coffee, but two's okay, you know. But, uh, but he knew his cost inside and out. And he, he didn't do it by getting a, a Harvard MBA. He did it because a dollar in is better than a dollar out. It, and I think, too, there's oftentimes it's not it's the applied education. It's applied knowledge. Knowledge isn't power until it's applied is the way I've always looked at it. And just because you have a business degree and that's where I think people get a business degree or they get an MBA and now they want to own and operate their own business. And they just think that somebody else goes to the other chain restaurants and tries the appetizers. No, it's the owner that does that. Like that's part of the deal. And like in my business, I had other owners would contact me and they would say, well, who do you, who do you have do your service? I go, what do you mean? What service? Like, well, on your equipment. I'm like, why do you? Well, you don't pay somebody for that? I'm like, no, why not? Because I can't afford to. What do you mean you can't afford to? I'm like, it's a $100 minimum service call and it's like 120 bucks an hour. And then the parts are marked up 30 to 40%. And if you add that up over a year, that takes a significant amount out of your profit or I can keep my profit and then I'm going to take that money out of expanding something I know we should be doing or maintenance or advertising or marketing. Like the money is not there. And sometimes they're like, yeah, but I'm like, no, like you can go ahead. I'll give you the phone numbers. I know the, the best service people. And if you really can't do it, they will. But I'm going to tell you right now, I don't, I haven't seen your books, but you're, the business won't support paying someone else. You have to do this or you have to learn. Yeah. I have a good guy that was my refrigeration guy. And uh, he was doing all I, I have. I had a ton of either refrigerators or freezers and uh, and uh, his name is Keith. But I remember seeing him long, at, probably a year or so after I sold the restaurant. And I said, Keith, I'm, I'm happy to see you now because you're a friend. But I'm, <laughs> sure, I'm sure happy I don't see you every week because I am I am so sick of fix my freezer, fix my ice machine, fix my cooler fix the, the ice cream machine. I mean, it just is a million things to do. And, uh, but I couldn't do refrigeration. So but he was my refrigeration guys. I'm sure he's still in business today, but a very reliable, very good guy. Uh, he, but he, I was saying, I'm happy I don't see you anymore, Keith. He is, he is still in business. He's still my HVAC guy. And okay. at the, my first location, I would get up on the roof with him. Yeah, and, and look at the HVAC rooftop units and everything else. And then when I moved, I said, even if I can't afford it, I am not getting on a ladder and climbing 20 feet up the side of a building. Like, those days are done. Like from now on, I will pay you. But yeah, and that's in, in there too is people don't understand regardless, for the most part, wherever you are in the United States, you're going to have a mechanical system providing heat and air conditioning for your facility. And it's costly to operate and it's costly to maintain. And those numbers, you might, as a a new owner, you might not have an issue for six months, eight months, or 12 months, but you will have an issue. And they're typically not cheap. No, no, not at all. And (laughs) I used to laugh with Keith, you know, it's like, and I, Keith, you know, I got another, I got, I got an ice machine broken or I got uh, my main cooler that I've got a boatload of perishable food in it is down. You got to come now or soon, you know, and he always did. He was very reliable, very good guy, but I was so, cause it's a, it's just a drain from the bottom line. Now it's part of my 30% fixed cost, um, but I still don't like it. And you need to know that there's a, there is a line item on the expense sheet that says, it, it says fixed cost. 
30 Mm percent and part of that number is from maintenance of your mechanical systems yeah Yeah, i could say uh, knowledge of my food costs my markups my uh, every expense that i had is probably a key that i'm really proud of Um, and uh, and that's probably what got me 20 years i was in the restaurant business for 20 years nine months and three days not that you counted. Not that I counted. <laughs> <laughs> now, so there's one story about the restaurant that I, I hope you don't mind sharing because I think it's a great story. And then let's let's talk, you know, if you'll share this story and I'll, I'll tell you what I'm referring to. And then let's transition how you exited restaurant to what you're doing now. Sure. Um, and, and that story is, Wait staff stacking up dishes. I think you told me years ago, and then trying to get out of the kitchen before any of them fell and broke on the floor. Yeah. Well, the restaurant is frustration enough, but um, we had uh, um, two bus tubs, but they're actually there's three on each stack. So you put up, you put the dirty dishes in this. You scrape off all the crap. You put the dirty dishes in there. And then the, the guy that's washing the dishes, he'll come out into the hallway and he'll bring the bus tubs of the dirty dishes back. But um, I, I was watching one of the waitresses, but she would come up and I hope you get this on video. <laughs> but they should come up and she put the dirty dishes there. Then she'd go, make sure they didn't fall. And I said, if you have to do this, maybe take it and put it in put it in the, in the, in the kitchen next to the dishwasher or tell him to get it. But every dish that you break is money that just goes out the door. And and it just, it drove me nuts. It's like, and well, this, okay, it's there. It's not falling. Okay. You know, it was, it was crazy. Uh, And yeah. And there's a few of those stories, you know, going down. what about, what about that? What was kind of the tipping point that made you want to exit the restaurant industry? Well, and and did the, did the dishes play a role in, and then another question I have is did that 10% because you, no matter what you did, you were taking 10%. Yeah. In your margin, you probably weren't driving that 10%. The only thing I could hope for is greater sales, you know, because I knew the margins, but I was just hoping for greater sales. Then the fixed costs remained the same, and I could have made a little extra money. Um, but what uh, what happened in the restaurant business is I was in the restaurant business for probably 10 years before I got my MBA. And, uh, and then I ran the business by the numbers. But um, once I got my MBA, I wanted to uh, do more in investments. So I went on and uh, got the certified financial planner designation. And I didn't want to be back in those days, the brokers were, they were like, uh, they would just sell ice to Eskimos. They would just, you know, here's, here's a stock, you should buy it. Here's this, you should buy it. And I didn't really believe in that. I believed in comprehensive financial planning. So well, how you hold it should be in the wife's name, the husband's name, joint name, your children's name and whatnot. And I believe that financial planning involved more than just your investments. It was your estate plan, your tax plan, uh, how, you, how you hold it, where you hold it, who's the beneficiary, et cetera. So I really believed in comprehensive financial planning, but the market wasn't there. These are the days of 8% commissions on mutual funds. And I, there were no commission mutual funds, no load commu- mutual funds. So what I did is I didn't register as a stockbroker. I registered as an investment advisor. So that means I just take a fee for helping people. There is no commissions. And so uh, I really firmly believe that that was the way to do business. That uh, like if you came to me, Ray, I'd say I, I and let's say with a million dollars and say, I want you to do this, this, this and this. But. I want you to change your trust so that if you died or, or if your wife died or Illinois has a 4% estate tax over $4 million. So if you have more than $4 million, 
the state of Illinois is going to take $160,000. Well, let's say you have $4 million, but you're married. Well, you're going to have more than that, but now we got to put them in two different trusts. So it's like that knowledge is what I was really thrilled about. So what I did is once I got my MBA and I got my CFP at the Certified Financial Planner at the same time, and I said, I'm going to hold my shingle out as an independent, non-affiliated financial advisor, and I was going to charge 1% to man- help people structure their finances and, and manage their finances. And there was no one else doing it at the time. And uh, the brokers were saying that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would just go broke after two years or something. Well, what happened was, is there was no software facilities for that and whatnot. So after doing that for about uh, four years, five years, and getting more clients consistently, but I was getting overwhelmed with, uh, I, like if you called me up and says, what's in my account? Since I don't hold your account, the mutual funds do, I used to get uh, downloads from them every morning, but I'd have to download it manually, every fund from every company. So uh, I did that for four or five years. And, uh, and I just took the attitude, if you don't like it, that your financial planner owns a restaurant, then tough, go to one of those brokers that's going to sell you eight and a half percent crap. So, uh, but then uh, the industry changed and the industry changed towards the way I do business. So the industry said, no, we're going to have we're, we're going to have independent brokers or independent financial advisors to compete with those brokers, and then I found an organization that'll do all the paperwork for me. So they would hold the assets, they will issue the statements, they will um, uh, collect the one percent fee that I was getting, and uh, and I could do pension plans, I could do just about anything that I couldn't do before. So it was like me dying and going to heaven. It was just like this, the world has turned to my way of doing business. So what I did is I said, I don't want to be 65 years old in the restaurant business. Now I'm making money and my kids I still had to go to college. But I just, I just said, uh, I'm going to follow my passion. The way we've been doing financial planning for the past four or five years is the wave of the future. I can be honest. I don't, if I sell you A versus B or get you into A, I make the same amount of money. Yeah, 1% period. And then I, what I had uh, internal software that I could do, use to statistically rebalance those portfolios. Um, and then once we, uh, I got in, so what I decided to do is sell the business and just focus on financial planning. I found a buyer for the uh, business I didn't sell the real estate, uh, so I had some rental income coming in. But I remember telling my wife at the time, I said, we have enough savings so that um, we can do this until next September, which is like a year and a half away. And then if this isn't working by then, I got to get a job. Now, luckily, I was a chartered financial analyst, MBA, and I could probably get a job as an analyst pretty easily. So I wasn't too worried, but I wanted financial planning to work. So, but between that time and the following September, um, we had a lot of clients come to us and that was the beginning of Walsh and Associates. And now we're uh, one of the biggest in the United States where we were recently voted uh, one of the best financial planners in the state. And uh, and we, we get clients now, we have clients in probably 45 states and, uh, and we're very, very successful at uh, managing the money and managing people's finances the way we want it. We think you should do it. So at the time, you're, you're running the restaurant. You've hung your shingle out there. You're, you're, you've chosen to do it your way yeah. instead of selling whatever paid the highest commission and telling everybody they needed it. Yeah. Uh, how much of a role did technology play in making everything kind of come together so you could do it yeah. your when way. I, yeah. When I was in graduate school, there were 773 mutual funds. Today, there's 29,000 mutual funds. So we didn't, and I would subscribe to software that would give me data of those 773. But the problem is, is there was data that I didn't have that I wanted. Well, the, the, um, 
the technology for the reporting of uh, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds with the advent of computers really opened it up. So it, it got it so that I could have the same capabilities as the, as the biggest of the financial houses. So, uh, and then when I moved to a broker dealer that had financial planning software as well, it was like me dying and going to heaven. It's like, I can use my knowledge from the, uh, as a chartered financial analyst to design and implement a portfolio is going to statistically probable to get you where you want to go. Uh, but it's not seat of the pants. Like here's a good thing. Here's a good thing. Here's a good thing. It's, it's, here's a risk that goes up and down like this. Here's a risk that goes opposite up. But one goes up, the other goes down. You combine the two, you have less risk in your portfolio. And, it, so. and it's kind of back to the numbers in the restaurant. Being a good steward, as I call it, being a good steward of your numbers and then having an understanding of statistics and probability, the good will, will outpace and wash away the bad. And you yeah. can look at and say, we can use this software and we can really project that if we're here now, we can move here and here's how we get here. Or we have a probability of moving there. You know, It's not a guarantee, but it's, it's probable. Yeah. Um, yeah, people, if, if you are in the, if you're in the investment field and you want to have a guarantee, there are none. I, that's not true. You can have a CD at the bank and the, and the bank will guarantee that you're going to make that amount of money for that amount of time. But if you deviate from that, there's a, it's a matter of risk. So and the, the big thing is to know what risk you're taking. Um, so, and it could be that one risk offsets another risk. So one thing goes up when the other thing goes down, but you can combine those things so that the ups and downs are less because you own both. Now, when one thing goes up, you love it. The other thing goes down, you hate it, but you're going to love the, when it goes the other way, you know? Right. So, so when we use statistics and, and probabilities, all it is, is, is designing the portfolio to statistically get a, get a return. There, there can be no promises because we don't know what the future is going to be. However, we do know what the past has been. So um, I kind of li liken it to um, investing as kind of like um, your, the investments that you have is like a yo-yo. And when it goes down, it's, oh, my God, oh, my God. Thank God, thank God. Oh my God, oh my God, thank God, thank God. But imagine that you're focusing on that yo-yo, but you're going up an escalator. So now when it's going, oh my God, oh my God, thank God, thank God, oh my God, oh my God, thank God, thank God. We do know where you're going to be 20 years from now or 10 That's years. That's a brilliant from. analogy. That and putting the yo-yo on the escalator is brilliant. That really makes it easy to see. Like, yes, it's it's gone down, but overall we're moving up exactly so and what happens is now you take that just one yo-yo now imagine a bunch of yo-yos going up and down the elevator and one goes down the other goes up and then it, and that's a diversified portfolio so like i'll tell clients i have no idea where you're going to be a year from now or when COVID hit when COVID hit people would call me and uh, let's say they were 100 percent in stocks well, 100% is stocks have never been beaten over any 20 year period. So if you have 100% of stocks and you're properly diversified, then I can say, you know, let's say you're 26 years old and this is money in your 401k plan. I don't know where it's going to be next year, but I do know where you're going to be in 20 years. And if you have bonds in your portfolio or other types of securities that reduce the risk of your portfolio, I'd, I'd have conversations with somebody during the beginning of COVID when the market was going down and say, I don't know where it's going to be a year from now. I can honestly say, I have no idea where it's going to be. I don't know how long COVID's going to last, but I do know over 10 years, if you stay where you're at, there's never been a 10 year period that's been down with this portfolio. Now, not be better off. The first. And, um, and so we're, we're working the odds. The problem is, is you just have to know the odds. You know, and, and we could be wrong, but uh, uh, the, the important thing is to know what risk you're taking 
and and when that risk happens, what does something else do? So if bonds go down, do stocks go up or vice versa? No? So in looking at the small business owner, and, and I was this guy, like I had had prior jobs and I had had rollover 401k stuff or what have you. And then was, was kind of in some cases getting tuition, like you buying a racehorse, you know, I put 10, 20,000 into this venture and it, it didn't work out. The money's gone. So, well, I'm going to throw some capital into this one and I'm going to ride it and see what I can do. And that meant in my eyes, I didn't have money to put away. Yeah. And, and here we are, it's 20 years later. And I, I would be better off at, well, that 20 grand would have been much better invested, but um, what do you tell the, and, and for me, it was, I had a good accountant. I had switched accountants a few times and it was Tom Stark, who you probably recall from, from yeah. the area where my business was. And he said, Hey, listen, he goes, well, we're going to go over your, you know, your accounting and stuff. He goes, but I'm a little concerned. You, you're not doing anything for retirement. He's like, you need to do that. And I'm like, well, I don't have any money. I got debt to get rid of. I got to do this. I got... He's like, yeah, that's, that's great. That's fine. Like, really, I don't, I don't know why your previous accountants didn't tell you this, but you, you really should be putting, even if it's, if it's a hundred bucks, just do something. Yeah. Just There's a, for small business owners, I tell them, regardless of their age, 20 years from now, you're going to be 20 years older or dead, one or the other. And if you're 20 years older, you have to eat. And if you have to eat, you should have money to eat. And, you know, if you're 40 years old when you're 66 and you're retired, you still got to eat and you got to have money. Now, one thing that's nice about for small business owners is, and we could go th over this. I could spend probably 10 hours of, of tape doing this. But... Um, one of the things that's nice about a small business is you can set up a pension plan, let's say a simple IRA or a, or a small business 401k, and that money is safe from creditors. So every business I think is starting out should say, I have to make it, you know, maybe not the first year, but as soon as you know you're going to make it, I would say put some money into a 401k plan or a pension plan and it's free from creditors. So that means if your business goes right to the can and you, and you lost every penny you put in, you don't lose your money from your 401k. It's still safe, for, you can file bankruptcy and your, and your 401k plan is still safe. So why would you not do it? And, and also you're gonna be 20 years older in 20 years, whether you like it or not, whether you're dead or not, I don't know, but. Uh, but in 20 years, you're going to be 20 years older and you're going to have to eat when you're 20 years older. So you might as well have some money stacked or stashed away that's been growing tax free for the last 20 years. But for small business owners, I'd say there's a couple of things um, that, that uh, I wouldn't I would never do. But one of them is if you're going to be successful if, or if you're going to if you're going to be alive. Make sure that at the end, you could have a great career, 30 year career, but have no money at the end of it because you spent it all. Uh, but if you but if you can put money in a 401k plan or, or a small business pension plan, uh, it's well worth it to do it. And people that are self-employed with no employees, they could put $19,500 per year into a four, uh, individual 401k if they want, and uh, it'll grow tax tax deferred until you take it out and then you'll be at a lower bracket when you take it out and that's got to come out of income so they need to have the, the you need to have the revenue in the amount of 19 and a half k to put the 19 and a half k away right but also you should understand when you're in business since you don't you're not covered let's say if you work for the university or if you work for the city or the state of illinois and uh, you would be you would be covered under a pension plan if you work there and just do your time, you'll have some kind of pension plan. Small business people are promised nothing. Just because they get 65 is a magic age for social security, <clears throat> or normally for social security. Now it's been arisen. But, uh, but you know, there's no magic age when you got to stop working. 
Uh, but if you're small business and you haven't saved anything, you better keep working because if you want to keep eating, you better keep working. But I always say you're going to 20 years from now, you're going to be 20 years older or dead, one or the other. And if you're 20 years older, you want to eat. So you want to put some money away if you at all possibly can. And that's where, you know, I, I think the take home point for the the business owner, and this was me, is, is like you need to, and I wish somebody really would have pushed me early on. I, I wish you know, I, I should have done some of these things far sooner than I started to do it. But pay attention to what Joe just said. Listen, like there's many advantages. I can tell you to some of the small business retirement instruments that are available. Go out and, and seek counsel from somebody like Joe, contact Joe and I'll, I'll provide his contact information. If you reach out to me or I'll put a link to his website or whatever, but get out there and, and ask. And even if it's a hundred bucks a month, just don't eat out that month. Like you, you have that, just do it and get in the habit of doing it. Now, there's other types of pension plans uh, that are, even, that are more, well, they're, they're really fun for me to find, but like we had a guy, his wife inherited money. So she came to the office to basically get the account moved from where she inherited it to her name. And he moved in, uh, he came in with her and we had a conversation while my sons were doing her paperwork. I was talking to him and I said, uh, are you working now? Cause he was in his late sixties. And he says, Oh yeah. And what he was is a, uh, a surgeon that he retired from being a surgeon, but now he's a rent a doctor, a rent a surgeon. But he would go and be, he would work for like two weeks or three weeks for some surgery center when somebody other surgeon went on vacation. But they were paying him phenomenal. And he'd work for three weeks and be off for two weeks and work for three weeks and be off for a week. But he made, uh, he made $180,000 working part time. And I said, and, he, and, and, and they love him. They paid all his expenses. They played his flight, his hotels his car rental while he's there. And he just worked for two or three weeks as a surgeon. And um, I said, that's amazing. Do you have any employees? And he says, no, it's just me. I just go there and I work. And I said, uh, uh, would you like to get a, he made 180 grand a year. I said, would you like to get $180,000 tax deduction? And he looks at me like, Joe, you're nuts. And I said, no, I said, there are types of pension plans where if you have no employees and it's based on your age, where you can put 100% of your money away. So, and then he says, tell me more. And then I said, you're going to love us, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and now that was probably five years ago. And he's a client. He's been putting almost his entire paycheck because he lives off his other money, but he doesn't have to pay tax on his pension, his 180 pension contribution. And that's in, in that too, for the, the business owners out there. And I don't care if you've been in business for 20 years or 30 years, and maybe you haven't figured this out. If you're new to business, it's, it's the age old. It's, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. And there's vehicles out there that are, and, and this is where like you and I talked before we, we actually started the, the actual webcast or pod, podcast there's, you know, there, there's reasons to be a small business owner. And one of them is there's vehicles that will allow you to put more money away tax deferred. In, in other words, you could potentially pay, like you know, we can say it as simply as there's nothing illegal. You're not breaking the tax code or laws. You're simply leveraging vehicles that small business owners have that reduce your tax obligation. And you should be doing that. Exactly. In his case, he, this, this surgeon, he fit the mold. He was late sixties, no employees and um, very little expenses. I mean, so basically we just said, do you want me to put the max in? Just, you can pay the tax later, you know, or, or do it over time. Uh, and he was just thrilled. He thought he thinks, I think he still thinks we walk on water, but uh, it, it, but even small stuff. business, small business is the same way. It's like, uh, you know, if you can put it away and not pay tax, it, that just it, it grows exponentially, but on a tax-free basis. 
Right. And you're going to, and the money has come in, you're either going to pay, let's say 20% of a hundred thousand. Let's say there's a hundred thousand in income, making up numbers. If anybody's watching this, I understand this may or may not be a tax rate. It's irrelevant. It's easy math. So if you bring a hundred grand in and you're, you're obligated to pay 20,000 out, well, in tax, wouldn't it be nice if maybe you took 20,000, 10,000 went to your silent partner, Uncle Sam, and 10% went to a retirement account where it compounded for the next 20 years. Yeah. And there's, we can do this in another podcast or you, if you want, but there are instances where uh, employees are eligible to do two different types of plans. They could do it like a 403B plan or a 457 plan. The university in your town has this type of plan. But um, you can, the employees there, if they're over 50, uh, actually, if they're over 59, they can put $23,000 into two plans. So let's say, for example, you were a secretary making $50,000. And you can put 20, 20 um, I'll just say 24000 It's not exactly, but you can put 24000 into this one, 24000 into that one, and you'll only get taxed on, on 2% of your pay. And the answer is usually, well, Joe, I got to eat, you know? So I can't put $25,000 away. Well, if you can, that's one option is you only pay tax on two grand. However, uh, in certain states, sometimes you can have two different types of plans. You can put into both of them, but at the same time you're putting into one, you're taking out of the same account. So it's like you put, let's say, $23,000 into this one, $23,000 into this one, and you take $23,000 out of this one. It's like, Joe, why would you ever want to put it in and take it out? Because you don't pay Illinois taxes on this amount. Illinois taxes are 5% roughly. So you're going to save $2,500. Just put it in, take it out the next day. There's no requirement to how long it has to be there. And those are the things that, again, it goes back to that simple. It's it's not just how much you make, it's how much you keep. And, and that's why you have a financial planner that knows that. that stuff. Yeah. And it's, and it's nothing illegal. You know, no, it's, and it's available for everybody, except well, every, you have to be over 50 and you have to be eligible for two different types of plans. But there are still vehicles, even for the small business owner. Like I had this conversation with some some business owners that are were, were looking at possibly developing an exit, exit strategy and they were weighing all of the scenarios. And, and one of the scenarios that has to be considered is if you move from being a business owner so maybe you're like, I just don't want to do this anymore. And you want to go just be an employee. You, you sometimes will give up access to that, maybe that self-employed pension yeah. or things like that. And that means that you can't put as much away for retirement tax deferred as you could as the business owner. Yeah. And every business is different. You know, if you have a lot of high paid employees uh, to do the extra for you, you have to do the extra for them. For them. And so sometimes it's not worth it, but every business is different. But uh, like that doctor, he had no employees and he, he was fortunate enough to be able to do a certain type of plan that he could do more than, you know, 20,000 or 30,000 bucks. But, but the, in business, it's kind of like, you gotta, you gotta know what the, you know, you could be a, a great physicist, you know, and you're making a million dollars a year doing something in physics. But you also, you're responsible for your own taxes and you're responsible for your own knowledge of your pension plan and stuff like this. That's why I call in somebody that knows pension plans or, or, or businesses, small businesses to say, oh, you're eligible for this and you're eligible for that, whether you have the money or the, or the wherewithal to do it. This is the way it works. And I, I think there's something to be said for that. And I was approached after I bought my brick and mortar business by an individual and he kept kind of badgering me to go to lunch, go to lunch, go to lunch, go to lunch. And at first I didn't know why. And then I, he told me what he did. I'm like, Oh, he wants to pitch me on investing with him. And so I, I went to lunch and in part, cause I wanted to be nice, but 
he was telling me stuff and it was very clear that he didn't understand the small business piece. The individual had been an employee for forever and somehow had gotten a job working for a, a company that did invest, retirement planning. And, and I was trying to explain to him, like, my, my money is better servicing my debt right now than it is with this vehicle you have. So from your standpoint, Joe, like, how often does it make sense to satisfy debt? And is that something that should come into the equation? You know, should you be looking at what your, your interest yeah. obligations are relative to a potential statistical return? Well, that's the difference between having a plan and not having a plan. Like in, uh, if you, let's say your spouse can do $20,000 into his or her plan, or you can do 10,000 each into yours. Sometimes it's better to have, have let's say you have an older spouse. So they're gonna reach the age that they can take it out with penalty free before you. So then it's be like, don't put it in your name, put it in his or her name. And, uh, but there, you have to, I know you're going to be older in 20 years or dead, period. So, but have a plan. If I have to get my debt paid and I have to eat when I'm 20 years older than now. So just have a plan. If I live, this is what we want to do. Now you can't so, tell the bank, I'm not going to pay you because I put my money in this. So it's, you know, it's, it's, not get applicable today, but let's say you have a, a commercial note at say eight and three quarters percent, nine percent, which in the not too distant past, there were interest rates that high on commercial money, depending on what I they had them in the were. restaurant business. Yeah. Yeah. So at that point, it, it, you know, is there a point where you should satisfy and eliminate debt before? you go on the maybe you might average 10, 12% over a decade. Yeah, and there's a cost of the debt and there's the expected rate of return on your portfolio long-term. Like a um, long time ago, I had 9% and 10% mortgage on my house. And I thought that was you know, cheap because it used to be 11% mortgage on the house. But it all has to do, it's all relative. You have an obligation to pay the bank and you have an obligation that you have to eat after you get old 20 years time. and it's just a matter of have a plan my you know financial planning is have a plan say this is my plan now things can change i could have six kids i have no kids now but maybe i'm going to have six kids six little kids to send to college but for right now this is my plan and just have a financial planner that says uh you know here's the plan now and then as the government changes the rules or the rules change just on their own like interest rates Make the switch, say, but that's where you, you can't have a plan that's not changeable. You know, you have to say, this is my plan. This is my progress. And then the government comes up with some stupid new rule. Well, we can't do it this way anymore. We got to do it this way. And that's why that surgeon, I said, oh, you're going to love me. Because I'm thinking no tax is better than, you know, and his wife, sure. the, his wife was in the office because she just inherited a million dollars. So it's like, you can't tell me you need the money because you didn't have this million dollars before you came in. Right. You know, you and, know. and that too is back to paying attention to the numbers. If if you're paying 9% on borrowed money and that cost of money drops to 2.9%, it may make sense to reduce the rate at which you're retiring the debt oh, and absolutely. increase the rate at which you're contributing to a retirement account. Yeah. And I tell I tell our clients, I'm not your mother. You know, I'll tell you what I would do. You can do it or not do it, but uh, I don't, I want to be the little bird on your shoulder that says, you got to save more, you're getting older, you got to save more, you're getting older, or you can afford that new car, you know, uh, or like I've had conversations, what are you keeping the money for? You're going to die someday, you know, for God's sakes, if you always wanted to see Paris, go see Paris, you know, you know, your kids won't appreciate it, you know, and whether they inherit Three million or four million. What's the difference to you? And you know? hopefully they can go make their own money and not need yours to begin with. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, financial planning is is mostly knowing the rules. You know, know how pensions work, know how investments work, know how estate planning works, know how taxes work, know how education sending your kids to college works. 
uh, Illinois, they have a deal where you can send your kids to kindergarten through 12th grade using 529s. And, and if you're sending your kids to school, you can you can put it in one day and get a tax deduction. So it's like a ten thousand dollar per per year tax deduction to, if you send your kids to school. And uh, that's a relatively new thing. But it's nice to know that, like, if you have small kids and they're going to private school or something like this, just know the rules, you know, and, and the rules change all the time. And, and so, so that's every system, it, every person is different. And there again, that's where you you probably need to reach out to somebody that has experience. And from from my past and the example I use of the gentleman I went to lunch with, make sure you sit down or talk by phone or do a Zoom or whatever it might be with somebody that not only understands the, the financial, just stocks, bonds, retirement, but they also need to understand if you're a small business owner, what it's like to be a small business owner, some of the numbers and some of the other things so that they don't just say, yeah, but the return averages this percent. Well, you may have, you know, not too long ago, interest rates were higher than they are. And sometimes the money was better spent getting rid of the debt. Oh, absolutely. I and had want to make. No, I was going to say I had a night. I, I The restaurant was open. The restaurant didn't close till one and two in the morning. And then I went down to the office and I figured out if, um, you know, how long, if I'm paying my mortgage, how long before that's going to be paid for? And I used my calculator and I said, oh, it's going to be, my restaurant's going to be paid for in, let's say, six years. And then I go, okay, well, how much will that give me per year to put on my house mortgage? So I calculated that all up and it said, oh, in another four years after that, my house and my restaurant could be paid off. And then I thought, how much more money per month will I have? And I calculated it out and it was a lot of money per month. And then I said, what do I want with that money? And I thought, I don't have anything to spend it on. The only thing I could think of was I want a copier for the office so I don't have to run down a Kinko's or something and pay a penny a piece. Because I, I, I'll be damned if I'm going to pay 900 bucks for a copier when I can get it for a penny a piece. Uh, but I, then I started laughing to myself thinking, you're 900 bucks away from total nirvana, you know? Go to, so I went out and bought the copier, you know, just so it's like, now I have everything I ever wanted and I don't have to wait for, for you know, how many years from now. So, but, it, but it, it's, it's just a plan. It's a, it's a plan for, and, and your debt has to be paid, you know, to the bank. And, uh, and you just want to make sure that, uh, you know, they get paid and you get paid. But obviously, being a small business, you have to understand that they get paid before you get paid, whether you like it or not. Right. Two silent partners. I always had, well, most of the time I had two. One was the bank and the other was Uncle Sam. And yep. it was required that each got paid. Before you. Before me. Before me. Yep. If anything was left, I got something. Yeah. Um, and it's nice knowing the, the uh, tax rules, too. You know, uh, we can we can have a whole session on selling your business uh, and, and how to how to structure that tax. But uh, but it's just knowing the rules. I can't stress enough uh, knowing the tax rules, know the estate rules, know the investment rules, uh, no marketing, no uh, accounting. You don't have to be a genius, but you got to have a, a general sense of what's you know, is A better than B or is B better than A? And be willing to ask for help when you don't. Absolutely. And, and seek the advice of, of maybe somebody that's more senior in business or maybe in, the, in your field, seek out the advice of the tax or the wealth management or the combination yeah. professional. Yeah, and in, in, I'm, I'm just thinking there's a million things that pop up. I'll give you an example. We had a person, he was selling his business. And, um, and when you sell an asset, when you realize the gain, that's when the gain is taxed. So what we did is we said, let's structure the deal so that you get one, let's say it's uh, November when he wants to sell it. You get one third in November. And then you get another third on January 1. 
And then the following January one, you get the third third. And uh, it can all be written into the contract. It can be all structured so that you're going to get the money and you know you're going to get the money. Maybe there's some guarantees in there. But you don't want to pay tax until you got it. So you can stretch that taxes over three years. So the, those capital gains taxes can be, you only pay a third of the capital gain the first year and a third the second and a third the third. So, uh, you know, it depends on what bracket you're on and whether that's smart or not. But uh, in, in that too, I think that, you, you know, your, your use of have a plan. I, I had always had a plan to exit my business. And then I, I scrapped it and I went a different direction. And there, there were a number of reasons for that. But at the end of the day, I did have a plan. And that at least meant that I had vested time and energy working on the business, thinking about and planning an exit strategy. So the, the business owner needs to work on the business for today and plan to grow for tomorrow. But then one day you may not have it anymore, whether it's a succession plan for somebody in the family, your daughter, your sons, whatever, or you're going to sell it. But you, once you're in business, you need to start be, beginning to plan for that. And you also need to plan, as Joe said, you could get sidelined with a huge tax bill that you didn't expect because you never put any thought into, okay, what does this look like one day if I sell it? And then also an intelligent wealth management individual like Joe is going to say, hey, listen, here's a better way to do this. Take a third for this calendar ta or this tax year, take a third next tax year and take the final third in the next tax year. And it's going to allow you to spread out that tax obligation so you don't get clobbered all at once. And there's um, there's uh, deductions as to, there, there's difference in tax rates if you're a corporation versus an LLC or a sole proprietor. So, um, and there's recapture of depreciation and whether you sell it as a stock sale or an asset sale. And, and the difference could be immense in taxes. I made an offer for uh, a restaurant that I was going to buy, it wasn't accepted, but uh, I, I wanted to buy it as a stock purchase and I would have gotten some phenomenal depreciation had they allowed me to do that. They had, this was a guy that didn't know the difference between a stock purchase and an asset purchase. And, uh, and if he had said yes, I would have been able to depreciate the entire purchase on a very fast basis. And, um, and he, didn't, he didn't say no because of the tax, but if, if, if he would have been dumb enough to take it under that system, I would have made a bundle in tax breaks. And in, in there again, um, I, I, I've done a, a stocks purchase and I've done a stock sale. And there, yeah, there's advantages, but you have to have an education going in. Just like at time of exit, you need to understand, are you going to sell the shares you own? Or are you going to sell the assets of? And what are the implications for you? Yeah. And there's a difference tax. That's a huge difference. So the, the, the implication is, is, I don't know any individual circumstance that, of the people that will see this video, but there is going to be a difference. And you got to get help from somebody to know the difference. Like you could be the greatest trainer on the planet, but you got to also be the, the investor and, the, and the, the, the dad. And there's a whole other parts of your life that uh, the accountant, you know, that make a huge difference in your wealth. And it, and it's, and again, that's where, you know, I, I know early on, uh, I mean, I was, I was pretty ignorant. I, bought this brick and mortar business. At the time I owned two other businesses and told my, my recent bride to be, or I guess no change that. Let me think through. No, we were married. I said, Hey, listen, we have to stop the accounting office. And um, I think we're going to get money back, which is, that's pretty good because we'll use that money to pay the property taxes on the house. So then we'll, we'll be good there and everything will be fine. Well, I walked in and I got, you know, bills for them having done the accounting on three corporations plus our personal returns. And then I owed a bunch of money and I'm like, now, wait a minute, I didn't pay myself anything. 
They're like, yeah, but the, the businesses realize income and a profit and that flows right down to your personal return. So even though you don't have the money in the eyes of the government, that's considered, that's still taxable income and you're obligated to pay the tax. And that's what the, the person that starts a business doesn't understand. They don't understand the tax ramifications, the ownership, whether it's owned by you or your, you and your spouse, by a corporation, an LLC. Um, like, for example, if you own, like I have all the time, we'll have somebody inheriting some land in Arkansas and they own one sixth of a hunting ranch or something with their brothers. And when they don't realize it, but when they die, that money, that uh, asset that's in Arkansas is going to be subject to Arkansas taxes, if there are any, and probate. So it might be that you don't have a large estate, but you have to hire an attorney just to get your one sixth of a $60,000 hunting land, some land. And it's like you have $10,000 worth of land, but it's gonna cost you $1,000 just to get it transferred to your kids. Right, and, and that too is, is people don't realize that $1,000 I would I would have customers all the time. Well, I would be upset about a change in the tax law or the tax code, or they they instituted an indoor tanning tax and we had indoor tanning beds, and it, the the IRS it, it ended up being the IRS said yes, you are obligated to collect and pay a tax on UV tanning beds, but we do not have a vehicle to collect the tax yet. Yet, as of this date, you are required to pay it. So I had to pay my accountant hours of his time to figure out that, yes, indeed, there is a tax to be collected. Yes, you are required to collect said tax. And yes, you are required to pay said tax. But the IRS has said we have no way for that tax to be paid. So th that money, it comes out of the business's pocket. And we still, we, I don't remember what form it was, but we had to fill out this eight or 10 page document of which there was one line item where I wrote in my dollar or total revenue and then the tax owed on it. And I had to mail it in. And, uh, and the first time I mailed in only the pages I filled stuff out on, signed and dated the last one, sent it in. The IRS rejected it, charged me a late fee and a fine. And I had to resubmit it. But all of that stuff, if you're new in business, all those things are going to cost money. And you're not, you're not, a, you're in, unless you're, you're a CPA and you're in the business of accounting, you're probably not, I knew I owed, I knew I had to pay tax on tanning and I knew what the percent the tax was, but I knew nothing else. So I had to pay somebody to go and sort through that only yeah. to find out that he confirmed everything I already knew and said they have no way to collect it, but you got to pay it anyways. Yeah, we we had a client that lives in Maryland, <clears throat> has never stepped foot into the state of Iowa, but she inherited three farms from someone in Iowa, and the Iowa farms had a 16% tax, a 16% state estate tax on these three farms, and they wouldn't turn them over into her name until she paid the tax. So she arranged for it to sell one of the farms because she didn't have the cash. I mean, this was millions of dollars. So she had to sell one of the farms to come up with the cash so that the state would, would release the other two to her so she could sell those. But it's 16% tax. And it's um, and oftentimes, if the person that sold it had a trust, they still got to pay the tax, but they could have taken their time to sell it. So what happens is, is all the time there's nuances on the tax rules that are specific to that state that you don't even under that you don't even know that they're there. Um, like uh, in here, uh, New Jersey has a tax to leave New Jersey. So you got to pay a certain amount of money when you sell your house and they keep this money until you buy another house in New Jersey. And if you don't, they get the money after two years. And but in that, again, you need to have a plan and be forward thinking enough so that 
you can consult with somebody that's an expert and at least have the knowledge of what you're getting into. Yeah. I'm forever calling either CPAs or attorneys about diff- the rules in different states. I'll say I have a client in Iowa. Is there a state or an estate or an inheritance tax? Yes or no. How do you address it? Do they hold the money or do, what do they do? Um, is there any other tax uh, uh, that I should know about about Massachusetts? Or there's, there's every state has it. I'd call our, uh, qualifying for uh, financial uh, for disability is like, what are your rules? Uh, we have a client that uh, in, inherited money in this state, but we want to take the money out, but she doesn't have the money to pay the inheritance tax. How do we get the access to the cash so we could sell something to pay the tax? before? So she can pay her bill. So she can pay her bill. But there's all kinds of rules and every state has different rules. And uh, oftentimes, you know, your your brother that lives in a different state wants to give you his money, but it's not going to be that smooth. And what we want to do is find out those rules before he dies. And, and, uh, and plan and t- for it. And plan for it. And you can title it. You know, and maybe you can title it in your trust. Maybe it should be a Maryland trust or a Minnesota trust, as opposed to an Illinois trust. It, there's different rules in every state. But that's, well, I get a kick out of doing it, though. I think uh, I think we covered a lot today, Joe. I think maybe we, if you're willing, we we sh- we should do something more specific on the investment side. Sure. Uh, I do want to ask, and I, I do this with everybody, and I think even when I, I I do this with clients today, you know, what are the top three must dos and don't dos? They're in every organization, every career, every profession, every industry, every business. So if you look back at your history as a business owner, and even what you do today is is a business. You've got employees, you've got offices in multiple states. Um, What what are your top three must do's for a business owner? And then what are the top three don't do's? Um, They kind of correlate together. But I would say uh, one of the, you gotta do, is prepare if it prepare for the business if it works, but also prepare for your life if it doesn't. Obviously, you want to uh, structure it so that um, you've tried to cross all your T's and dot all your I's if it works. But if not, um, are you are you going to be flat broke if if this doesn't work? So have a backup plan so if this doesn't work. But the other thing is just like with uh, every other business, there's other business owners that would love to share their mistakes. So, uh, you know, reach out to other people who you know used to be in that business or something. And like, you know, what would you do differently if you started another restaurant? Um, uh, or would you start another restaurant? Uh, but but kind of know, you have a backup plan. So. You, you, this is what we plan on if we're successful, but have a black backup plan. And don't have it that the backup plan is you go bankrupt and you lose everything you got at age 46 or something. Okay. And then know the second one for what you should do is know the business and know the market. Um, there's nothing uh, more frustrating than like that guy that was the cheaper pizza than me. He was doomed at the start. There's no way you can sell that pizza for that price and not eventually go broke. So um, uh, more people go broke over low price than high price. So if you're trying to be the lowest cost producer, it's going to be really hard to make money. And you know, if Pizza Hut pizzas are this amount, what makes you think that you can get them cheaper than Pizza Hut? You know. Uh, and if you say, well, it only costs this much to make it. Yeah, it only costs me. Uh, it costs me 30% for my food, 35% for my food costs. So, yeah, I sold it for three times what it cost me to make it. But that I only made 10%. So know your costs and know your margins. And, and But you should know, if you don't know going in, you should know it real soon. And then the third thing that the must do is, is know what you don't know, which is really hard. 
But if you're not good at accounting, learn about accounting or get a great accountant. But have them teach you. I, I can honestly say when the accountant came to me, I just said, thank you very much. How much did I make? How much taxes am I going to have to pay? But the accounting will tell you what your margins are. It'll tell you how much you made in each area. You can structure it any way you want. But get a good accountant and have them teach you, you know, how much you're spending on fixed costs versus variable costs and how much you're making per dollar or per year or per hour or whatever it is. Um, what the three must not do is think that you're going to be selling McDonald's burgers for cheaper than McDonald's. I mean, they know the numbers, they know the locations, they know you're not going to be cheaper. You can be better for a better service, but you're not going to be cheaper. So I wouldn't go head to head against McDonald's or Burger King or Dunkin' Donuts or any of those chains. They know their numbers. And they make good money, but they know their numbers and they know the locations. Um, um, and then get an education. Uh, if, if you have spare time, learn about accounting. Um, or even if you talk to your own CPA, learn why, what is this number? It says depreciation. What's depreciation? Uh, and how is it calculated? And, uh, but just learn about what you're doing. Um, don't be the do not do is you're not going to be cheaper than everybody else. Um, uh, also look for the niche. Uh, there's a uh, famous uh, marketing person named Michael Porter from uh, Harvard. And he said, you either have to be the low cost producer like Walmart or have a niche. That's the only two people that are going to make disproportionate amounts of money. Uh, be the low cost producer like Walmart is uh, struggling, they want to keep the prices as low as possible, or have a niche. And the niche could be whatever your small business is, but have it so that you do this type of thing for this type of people, but have a niche. Um, and, uh, and, and continuously learn. Uh, you should, if you're in the XYZ building business, in in three, four, five years, you should be the absolute expert at the three, four, uh, the, the, that business. You should just keep doing your homework and doing it yourself. You're always going to look to uh, to see what you're making money on and what you're not, hopefully. But you should also know the direction of the industry. So if the industry is going away from mom and pop breakfast stores and going to the chain breakfast store, you should know you might get your lunch handed to you. So, um, uh, and, and I would say get as much education, get as much help as you possibly can. And there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of, I do classes on all kinds of topic matters. And, um, you know, I don't know anything about, um, let's say uh, like one of the, I had a small, starting a small business class and one of the people they were gonna make brownies and send them to people for their birthday. So they make the brownies and do it. And I said, well, the problem with that is you have to have a kitchen that's, you know, inspected by the authorities to make sure it's, uh, it's sanitary and everything. And they said, well, I was going to do it out of my house. And I said, you know, why don't you talk to a local restaurant? If you work there, let's say you're making brownies, like in my pizza oven, I can make brownies if I turn the temperature down. And we're closed from two in the morning till 11 in the morning. Maybe you can make a deal with some pizza restaurant to make brownies in their kitchen. And it's all inspected and everything. And you just do it from two in the morning till 11 in the morning. Now, it's not convenient, but you got you got an inspected kitchen and you got a giant uh, uh, ovens to to make them in volume. But in, investigate your options. Don't just think you have to make these at home. Um, and then. Uh, I would learn accounting too. So I know that's more than two. That's more than three. So Ray. you're getting an extra question on this, Joe, because you kind of, you had the restaurant, you had the horse experiment gone awry, and now you have what you currently do. And it gives you, a, a, I think, a diverse and different perspective. And, and probably there's a lot of serial entrepreneurs if you've been around long enough, you've been in business long enough, you've got a few decades of, of wisdom, I would probably ask them this question, but I think you're perfect for it. So 
if you're looking at everything you know sitting here today, what would you tell that 20 something year old that said, Hey, I, I'm going to quit my job because I'm going to go start my own restaurant? Like, what would you tell yourself at that point in time, knowing everything you got in your knowledge toolbox today? Yeah, I, it, I actually, that's happened. I had an old employee that wanted to know my recipes. He wanted to know if I would sell him my recipes. And I said, no, I'll give them to you because I'm never going into the restaurant business again. <laughs> I'll just give them to you. So I, uh, I had to find them for one. And now when you're in the restaurant business, we would, you know, these recipes are for, you know, huge quantities at one time. But I gave him all the recipes. But um, it, I'd say um, know your margins. If it was a restaurant business, I'd say know your margins. And I'm sure the margins are different today than they were back when I did it. Um, so, uh, no, um, no, every cost, labor costs, food costs, fixed costs. If you know your costs then you, it's a whole lot easier to know your, make decisions. Um, and if I would, I would say the recipes are the easy portion, I would say, but, uh, actually I had a financial planning client that he makes uh, him and his wife make probably two and a half million dollars a year in the computer business. And it's a small consulting business. Uh, but he wanted to open a restaurant. And I thought, what in God's name do you want to open a restaurant for when you're making two and a half? And he says, I just always wanted a restaurant. And he did. And he had it for about three years. and He lost money all three years and he sold it. But he doesn't kick himself because, one, he could afford to lose it. But, uh, but basically, um, he just didn't do anything as far as managing the restaurant. He kind of liked being the guy that owned the restaurant, but he had managers that he called them managers, but they were, they were babysitters. They weren't, you know, you need a manager for your restaurant, one that manages the numbers, manages the people, manages the margins, not just can schedule waitresses or schedule cooks. Um, so it, it, it sounds like that. I mean, a lot of what you would tell your much younger self, well, maybe don't, don't even get into the restaurant, skip so, it, but the numbers, yeah. like really you got to know yeah. those numbers. Yeah. And understand that the chains know their numbers, you know, like uh, McDonald's doesn't put a McDonald's in your town unless they know they can make those numbers. Um, so, uh, and, and not everybody is, if you, you better, if you own a restaurant, at least, you better be plan on being there most of the time. Because uh, it's, uh, it's not the day-to-day -day stuff that, you, you know, we can trust good employees and stuff like that. But it's the crisis situation. You know, when, uh, when uh, like we had a giant snowstorm in Illinois, and they were closing all the restaurants. And uh, my restaurant was packed. And the city called me up and said, uh, said, you got to close because we're trying to get everybody off the street. And I said, well, I know the code for the this, this city and you don't have the power to close me. You know, and they were closing only ones that served liquor, not all the restaurants, just the ones <laughs> that served liquor. And I knew the liquor code inside now. So um, I, knew every, every, I knew everything you can do and everything you couldn't. So the city called me up and then the police chief called me up and told me I have to close. And I said, you have no authority to close me. Show me on the books where you can close a restaurant and just the liquor license restaurants. And I'd be happy to close, but I know the code, you can't close me. And then uh, uh, maybe an hour later, the mayor called me and she was a very close personal friend. She was actually a client too. Uh, and she says, do it. And I told her, I said the same thing. I, I'm not going to close. You have no power to close me. I'm, I got a full restaurant and I'm not going to do it. I mean, this is a time to make money. And, uh, and then she said, do it for me. And oh God, oh, you know, she's a good close personal friend. So I said, okay, I won't do anybody else. I'll take care of the people that are in the restaurant now and I'll close. So that's what I did. But it's, uh, but it's, you got to make hay when the sun shines. But 
and and I I really admired this mayor of DeKalb, and uh, and she was always nice to me. And when she said, "Do it for me," it's like, "Oh God, I have to," you know. So I just did. But uh, there's a whole bunch of stories like that. But uh, I don't even know. Well, I think tangent. I think uh, well, tangents are good because they're real and there's value in that. And I think there again, being aware, like we custom built a front counter in our operation. So it, it wasn't like a countertop was bought or anything. Like the whole thing was custom and the carpenter gets done. Someone from the city comes in and they're like, wait a minute, where's, well, this isn't going to work. I said, what do you mean? They're like, well, this is an ADA compliant. I go, what do you mean? Like, well, you need to have an area this big, this low, whatever. You have to move this. You're going to have to cut this up. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I call my carpenter. He comes in, cuts a big section of the counter, rebuilds it. So now we got to repaint. we got to redo. It's the front of the operation. So now we're, it's a dusty mess. We just did a grand opening. A general contractor friend of mine comes in, and he looks at it and goes, why'd you cut your counter? This was really nice. I'm like, well, the city said I had to, because it had to be ADA compliant. They're like, he looked at me, he said, did they show you that in the code book? And I'm like, no. He's like, yeah, cause they can't, it's not in there. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, they can't make you do that. I'm like, well, they said, and he's like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't care what they said. You, you were under no obligation to do that. And by the way, this looks like shit now. <laughs> So I was like, but I didn't know. I had no idea. They said I had to, so I did. Yeah. Well, that's that was my argument. I knew the code inside and out. I knew every single word of the liquor code. So, uh, and they were only shutting down liquor stores, liquor liquor stores and restaurants with liquor. So I said, Which how about if you? I just don't serve liquor? And they said, no, you got to shut down. Because you might serve liquor. I don't know. That's but, crazy. Uh, but I like the finance. There's a there's way more rules in the financial planning business. I mean, I mean, there's a rule every time I turn around that's that's changing. But it's mostly looking out for the consumers. So I'm all in favor of that. And there's a lot of financial planners that um, don't operate on the up and up. And I I uh, say the public does have to be protected from some of the ones that are not operating on the up and up. And, and I, I think that that, you know, that makes sense. And I think it's, it's reasonable to have a structure and rules and guidelines so that the public or the consumer can't be taken advantage, advantage of or fraudulently taken advantage of for sure. If you like our content be sure to subscribe to our channel leave us a comment below also be sure to check us out on your favorite podcast provider see the links in the description below securities offered through lpl financial member finra sipc financial planning and investment advice are offered through walsh and associates a registered investment advisor and separate entity from lpl financial the opinions voiced in this program are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. There is no assurance that the views or strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision. Illustrations used herein may not be representative of the experience of all clients and are not indicative of future performance or success. Investing involves risks including possible loss of principal. LPL Financial does not provide tax or legal advice and this information is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized tax or legal advice. We suggest that you discuss your specific situation with a qualified tax or legal advisor.